Welcome to the Asian Madness Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica, and this podcast will be focusing on the continent of Asia, including true crime, urban legends, superstitions, mysteries, and maybe even some personal stories. If this is something you think you might enjoy, I encourage you to try out my podcast. Please note that I am new to the game, and I am still exploring editing and recording techniques. Thank you, and let the madness begin. The Republic of the Philippines, named after King Philip II of Spain, is a Southeast Asian country housing around 80 indigenous groups, which includes around 175 different spoken languages. The capital city is Manila, and the population as of 2016 is around 103 million. This country consists of more than 7,500 islands adding up to a total of around 117 square miles. Comparison-wise, 33 Philippines make up about one United States. The Philippines is considered a strong blend of both the Western and the Asian world, whether it be cultural or the population in general. The Philippines was at one point colonized by Spain and by the United States. And being neighbors with China and other Southeast Asian countries, it adds a strong Asian touch to the country. The official language of the Philippines is Filipino and English. We will be traveling to the Philippines for this case. Manila in the 1960s, to be more exact. This is the case known as the Chop Chop Lady, also known as the murder of Lucila Lalu. I will do my best to pronounce everything correctly so if I do screw up, please forgive me. There will be some graphic and sensitive content, so please proceed with caution. Let's start from the beginning. Lucila Lalu was a young woman in her 20s who left a town called Kandaba to travel to the capital city of Manila sometime in the year 1961 in search of a better life. Distance-wise, it's about a a two-and-a-half-hour drive. Once Lalu arrived in Manila, her life started to improve significantly, but up to a certain point, of course. Not to give any spoilers, but this does not end well for her. Lalu quickly found a job waitressing at a small local nightclub, and eventually met and fell in love with a policeman named Aniano Vera. One thing, though. Policeman Vera was a married man. According to my research, It says that she became his common-law wife anyway. Just in case anyone is confused about this common-law wife and husband thing, it's basically a marriage where you're regarded as a husband and wife without the legal procedures. This relationship with Vera resulted in one son. Later on, she used her savings to buy out the owners of the Pagoda Soda Fountain a restaurant-slash-cocktail lounge. Business was booming. Eventually, she even went on to establish a second business, a beauty salon called Lucy's House of Beauty. Now she was not only successful in love and family, but she was also an owner of two businesses. This is not exactly a very strange occurrence in the Philippines, but more on that later. She met a young man named Florante Rellos, who was 19 and a waiter at the Pagoda Soda Fountain. They quickly became lovers, and she set him up in an apartment and basically helped him out financially. Life was pretty amazing for Lucila. At this time, she was only in her late 20s. But like any other story we hear in true crime podcasts, her life took a dramatic turn. On the night of May 29, 1967, a garbage collector, Pablo Besar, was out doing his job when he smelled a specific sort of smell, the smell of dead humans. 
I'm not sure how he knew the smell, but it was something he was able to identify. He took the trash out of his truck, put it back out on the street, and called the police. Once the police arrived, they discovered a set of legs neatly wrapped in old newspaper. The legs were cut neatly into four parts, cut at the knees and at the hips. So that went downhill really fast. And according to the garbage collector, the wrapped up legs felt rather cold, as if they had been stored in the freezer before being disposed of. These legs were found very close to the Pagoda Soda Fountain, one of Lucila's business establishments. A day later, a legless, headless human torso, also wrapped in old newspaper, was found in a vacant lot about an hour's drive from where her legs were discovered, near the city of Makati. Since her hands were still intact, they were able to pull fingerprints off her hands and it matched the identity of the legs and that of Lucila Lalu, age 29. She was also said to be one month pregnant at the time of her death. According to the autopsy report, the cuts made to her legs were done in a professional way, maybe something that only a butcher or a doctor or a pre-med student would have knowledge of. The killer must have owned a vehicle as well because of the transportation of the body parts. Now that we know of her death, there are two very important questions that still need to be answered. Who killed her? And where was her head? This case was a total mess. Sure, they had a couple suspects, but the investigation was really lacking. Let's start with suspect number one, her 19-year-old lover, Florante Relos. Upon being questioned, he stated that he had an alibi for that night and that he was on good terms with Lucila. He really had no reason to kill her. His friends also corroborated his alibi, and he was soon released. Aside from being the lover of Lucila and a likely suspect, they really had no concrete proof. Next up, we have Aniano Vera, Lucila's common-law husband. He was a suspect for the same reasons, because he's usually the boyfriend or the husband. But, like Relos, he also lacked distinct motive. He was said to have gotten in a fight with Rellos once because of jealousy, but after looking into that incident, they found nothing else and had to let him go as well. Vera was also a member of the MPD, Manila Police Department. Could this have made a difference? Rumors regarding Lucila's death began to fly around, and in order to find more suspects, the police had to go around digging into her personal life which was rumored to be, well, exciting. Her neighbors claimed that they saw a few men around Lucila's residence, dragging something that resembled a body. But this claim was thrown out after Vera said he was with her a few hours after the neighbors claimed that they saw the body. Lucila's friends also claimed that she was about to dump her younger lover. But Relos denies this and insists that she was very much in love with him still. Now you see why this case was a mess. No proof on the usual suspects and everyone was basically telling their own story. Every time police took someone into custody, the media and the public would be very quick to condemn them, but only to change their minds a few days later. The investigation did take a startling turn on June 15th more than two weeks after her murder. A 28-year-old dental student named Jose Luis Santiano, who was also a tenant living above Lucila's beauty salon, was picked up by the police. Soon later, he confessed to the crime. Santiano was a married man with five children. According to his confession, Lucila was coming on to him, and he was only trying to reject her. Also, he claimed he was blackout drunk. He killed her by accident by strangling her, so he had to cut her up so it would be easier to dispose of her body. He threw her head in the creek in Quezon City, a city right outside of Manila. 
By this point, you'd expect the police to be all over his confession and looking through his apartment for weapons and clues, except that did not happen. They pretty much were like, great, so he confessed and although he's just a dental student, it's still kind of medical related, right? So it should be fine. Except they weren't expecting Santiano to suddenly recant his confession later on, right after the case was handed over to NBI, National Bureau of Investigations. Santiano changed his story, admitting that although he did not kill her, he was actually a witness to her murder. His story goes, There were two men strangling Lucila to death, while the third man held a gun to his head. So he was there at the wrong place at the wrong time? Or people were out for Lucila but somehow got him to take the fall. Here's his account of what happened that night. I was on my way to the ground floor when I met three men dragging Lucila up the stairs to the mezzanine. Suddenly, one of the men dressed in a pair of khaki pants and checkered polo shirt and a dark colored corduroy cap poked a thirty eight caliber revolver at me and order me to go back to my bedroom. I was immediately hustled off to my bedroom and ordered to sit on my bed beside the same man, who kept point the gun at me. Shortly after, I heard a scuttle in the living room, followed by a groan, which I presumed to be that of Lucila. Soon after, my guard and I went out of the bedroom, and I saw Lucila sprawled dead on the floor. Then the two men who were with Lucila lifted her and carried her downstairs. In a short while, a car door slammed shut and I heard the car speeding away. All the while, my guard stood by me, his gun in his hand. Santiano gave a description of the man who held him captive, also stating that he has never seen him before. Before the man left, he warned Santiano not to say a word of what happened, or else... So why did he say he did it? It was said that he was coerced by the police to confess to the crime when he was initially picked up, but once things went too far, he broke down and told the truth. Since the police failed to investigate properly after his initial arrest, the weapons they found in his apartment afterwards during a search were not entirely definitive. There were weapons that Santiano confessed to using to kill Lucila in his initial statement. But was it real evidence? Or could it have been planted afterwards? The general law enforcement population was still convinced that Santiano was their guy. They said that his initial confession was so convincing and concrete that it was enough to charge him for murder. But on the other hand, his information and witness account might actually be true. Remember the neighbors who claimed they saw some men carrying something that resembled a body? This sort of sounds consistent to Santiano's story where three men were murdering Lucila and keeping him hostage. But they could have killed him too, right? The three men could have decided to keep him alive so that he could be their fall guy in case of an emergency. Maybe they pressured him to go to the police and admit to the crime? Can't rule that out completely. Which version of his story do you believe? Now you really see what I mean by Messi. In the end, they could not charge him, and he was found not guilty of all charges. There supposedly was a fourth suspect. A wealthy firm executive was looked into, but that did not work out. I couldn't find any other information regarding this mystery executive. Okay, so now you have the facts of the story. But what do you think really happened? Lucila was a self-made woman. She was determined, strong, and very devoted to improving her life. In other words, she was young and she had money to do as she pleased. It really isn't that shocking if she had a couple different lovers on the side, as she wasn't even legally married to anyone. Was it her lover? Her common-law husband? The dental student? or quite possibly some other lover who no one even knew about. It was rumored that she was about a month pregnant, and we have heard of so many tales of men killing women over unwanted or surprised pregnancies. Or maybe it could have been a jealous lover who got mad at her for getting pregnant with some other guy. 
For some true crime buffs out there, this case may have sounded slightly familiar to you. Remember the aspiring actress who disappeared and then was found murdered and mutilated in 1947? Yes, the Black Dahlia, Elizabeth Short. There was a theory that the person who killed Elizabeth Short traveled all the way to Manila and ended up doing the same deed to Lucila Lalu. Honestly, aside from the torso cut in half, it's hard to see a resemblance between the two. Lucila was dismembered but wrapped up and disposed of, while Elizabeth Short's murder was displayed. The theory came from a book written by Steve Hodell, a retired L.A. detective, claiming that his father, Dr. George Hodell, not only killed Elizabeth Short, but also Lucila. Weirdly enough, Dr. George Hodell did move to Manila in the 1950s, and he lived there for about 40 years. I can see how this theory is brought up, but in the end, is it just a coincidence? Dr. George Hodel was an American physician who was known to be very intelligent and a musical prodigy. His son accused him of being both Elizabeth Short's killer and the Zodiac killer. But that's another story for another time. If you're curious about Steve Hodel's theories about his father, you should definitely go look up his book. And I will include the name in my show notes. There's also the jigsaw murder of Lucilla Lalu in Manila in 1967. The crime is identical to the Black Dahlia, the body surgically bisected and posed in plain sight in a vacant lot. At the time, my father lived a half mile away. What I just played for you was an excerpt from an interview given by Steve Hodel regarding his book. And although he says that the two crimes are identical, I beg to differ. I wasn't aware of the fact that his father lived just half a mile away, and that really blew my mind. With that piece of information, could his father have been the mysterious executive? The same year that Lucila turned up murdered, Film director Artemio Marquez grabbed at the opportunity to turn this unsolved case into a movie. This is the definition of too soon. He faced a lot of criticism and backlash for taking advantage of a poor woman's misfortune. But he continued anyway and finished the entire movie in just four days. During my research into this case, I found some very interesting facts about the Philippines that I would like to share with you. Historically speaking, women in the Philippines had a lot of power, whether it be in families or work or government. Things changed when Spain took over the Philippines. They were pretty shocked at how much power women had, and it was then that women began to shift their roles to the dutiful wife who stayed home and helped with the family duties while the men were out being manly and bringing money and food home. Despite the influence, the Philippines is still, in essence, a matriarchal society. This is why Lucila, being a strong and successful woman, wasn't something out of the ordinary. If anyone would be fighting for gender equality, it might actually be the men in the Philippines. Anyway, remember the two questions I raised earlier? Well, no one was ever really charged for her murder, and her head has never been found. Personally speaking, I sort of lean on the idea that maybe Lucila had gotten involved with the wrong crowd at some point, and once that person or group was unhappy with her, they decided to take her out. This is, if I believe, the story about the three unknown men. But if not, it could literally be any of her lovers. Maybe she did have a fling with the dental student, but once he found out she was pregnant, he was terrified of his original family finding out. I also wondered about her common-law husband's real wife. I couldn't find any information on her, so it's kind of difficult to make any assumptions. I would tend to think that she wasn't thrilled about it, but for all I know, 
she could have cared less. I'd like to share another piece of interesting information before I leave you. Did you know that Lucy Lalalu wasn't the only chop chop lady in the Philippines? Well, she wasn't. There was another woman by the name of Elsa Castillo. She was murdered by her boyfriend, an American man named Stephen Mark Weishunt, in the year 1993. He stabbed her with a kitchen knife and then dismembered her. He collected her parts and put them in four garbage bags and tossed her remains all over the city. He was eventually captured and was sentenced to life in the National Bilibid Prisons of the Philippines. But he was released in 2013 because he was being a very good boy. He has since been deported back to Los Angeles and California. He could be your neighbor. So there you have it. This was a really interesting case with a bunch of random details. I'm really eager to hear everyone's ideas and theories. The interesting part of presenting a cold case is that the more we think, agree, and disagree, the better the discussion. I'd like to thank you again for staying with me and for tuning in to this week's episode. It really means a lot, and I know this is far from perfect, but I'm still working things out, and I promise you, I will get better and better. I really hope you guys enjoyed this week's content, because I really enjoyed looking into this case. So on that note, if you liked what you heard, Please rate, review, and subscribe. It would mean the world to me. I'm super excited to say that I actually have five reviews right now on iTunes. I may or may not have more on other platforms, but I won't know till later this month. I'd like to thank the following people for rating and reviewing from the U.S. J-E-S-H-O-U-T-E-X. I am so sorry. I do not know how to pronounce that, and I don't want to offend you. Ben Keller, 79, and Bossy Pants, 16, a.k.a. Lainey from the True Crime Fan Club podcast. From Canada, 2016, TRS, 300. And from Finland, Johanna. Thank you, guys. I am so flattered. Thank you so much for the kind words and them stars. Please follow me on Instagram and Twitter at AsianMadnessPod for more information and show notes. You can also email me at AsianMadnessPod at gmail.com for any suggestions. I'm your host, Jessica, a.k.a. The Mad Asian. Till next time.